So it would appear that we have reached that once in a decade moment where the planets align, a comet is seen in the sky, and we're graced by a sequel to an id software game made by an entirely different development team. Not only a different company, but unlike those once in a decade moments from the past, Rage 2 is not built on the back of the latest numbered iteration of id tech, rather the Apex engine. Interesting times we live in. I'm not sure about you, but as a PC player, Rage's release on PC in 2011 was rather disappointing. Gone was the cutting edge real time, all the time mantra from Doom 3, as Rage's world was static and dynamic elements stuck out, reliefed against their backgrounds. And the release itself was marred with problems, which we really shouldn't have expected from such a PC driven studio as id. AMD cards didn't work at all, and the game lacked meaningful PC support in many areas. All these years later, it is only possible to support greater than 60 FPS gameplay through player mods. <sighs> I'm still imagining what Rage could have been if they kept to that initial dream instead of limiting the game so much to run on consoles. But what about Avalanche's game here in Rage 2? Does it languish under the same faults as its predecessor? What does it take to beat what we already have on consoles? Well, let's find out. It all starts off pretty well when you load up the game for the first time. The first thing that really caught my eye was that nice V-U-L-K-A-N sitting there in the corner in the OSD. Yep, Rage 2 is a Vulcan-only game. The low-level API gives me high hopes that sputters and CPU bounding will be less of a problem in this game, but I'll get back to that in a moment. Settings-wise, I'm pretty content with what the game has on offer. The game supports 21x9 as I see it, although HUD elements and menu elements are concentrated into that 16x9 space, but field of view is uncompromised and seriously attractive looking. FOV slider? You betcha. Chromatic aberration of motion blur toggles? Sure, why not? so quality of life issues on the primary level are covered. It's only when you go deeper into the menu looking for meaningful scalability that problems can come up. My goal with this video is to show just how far we can push PC above consoles and how we can make intelligent sacrifices to put mid-range hardware into positions of glory. The best console is running at 1080p60, with some dips, and with no going above 1920 by 1080 even in those moments where there is available GPU headroom to spare. I was understandably excited when I saw a dynamic resolution option here in the menu where you can control the frame rate target and minimum resolution. I was similarly understandably disappointed when I found out how utterly broken it is. Turning it on when previously set to off does nothing. Yep, no measurable change in gameplay based upon frame rate target or minimum resolution. It just looks the same. I was originally going to write this off as a broken feature, but the story gets strange. Angelo Negro of Oetablo de tipped me off as to how it in fact works. Works. If you initially set to manual resolution scaling and then turn it to auto, the game will in fact adjust the resolution in real time just not at all based upon any of your set metrics. As I see it, all it does is incrementally increase the internal resolution based upon screen movement. In my case, that meant jumping. Just take a look at how low energy this image with zero jumps is. Pfft, so low res. Now take a look at it at four jumps, 12 jumps, 16 jumps. Now that is some serious dynamic resolution scaling. Even when limiting the threshold to 120 FPS, the game just scales up to your native resolution after a bit of screen movement. So the feature is either incredibly unintuitive or very broken and needs fixing. Beyond adjusting your output resolution or internal resolution with a manual slider, screen space and inclusion is the biggest unintrusive win as found in the menu. Just going from ultra to high will yield a 9% performance increase with very little degradation in ambient occlusion coverage. On the other hand, going down to medium seems to eliminate the larger radius of ambient occlusion, leaving only a smaller one, but a 13% increase in performance over ultra. Going to low further cuts on the fidelity of this lower scale ambient occlusion with 16% greater performance than ultra. Turning it off shows how neutrally authored Rage 2's textures are, but it also leaves an unflattering look for its 25% performance increase over ultra. I recommend high here. 
Looking at the Xbox One X, it appears to be using the high setting here and not medium, which has a different look altogether, nor is it really using ultra, which has a smoother gradient from objects halos, unlike high, which has a more severe fall off, something also seen on Xbox One X. The next easy win, or somewhat easy win, is found in shadow resolution. In the close to midfield, Turning down from ultra to high sees a minor degradation of the cascade resolution quality, but a somewhat significant, I guess, 2% performance increase. Such a minimal difference, but a nice one. Going to medium and low, on the other hand, offer minimal performance benefits above this at the cost of severe degradation to shadow quality and an obvious cascade line in the middle to near distance. When switching over to views that showcase a greater draw distance, both ultra and high maintain crisp contact shadows beneath brush into the distance, while medium leaves many details with absent or hovering shadows. Low next to my recommended high just shows how much that extra resolution can help ground objects into the distance and keep them from peter panning. Going over to Xbox One X here, we see a more in-between setting. In terms of general resolution of the distance shadows, it looks closest to medium. But unlike PC medium, it is missing some shadows in the distance, much like low is, so it is a little worse than PC medium in that regard. The last easy win can be found in the shadowed light setting. This setting controls the distance from the camera at which point lights and spotlights that are not the sun can start casting shadows. Ultra and high cover far distances, and it's rare to see a shadow pop in. Medium, on the other hand, sees the first real obvious near camera differences. Low leaves point light shadows popping in distractingly close to the camera. Getting a measurable difference in performance though was still not possible, so out of caution I recommend the more reasonable high setting just in case there's that random scene with many shadow casting lights. Xbox One X here, when tucked into that same corner where shadows on high disappear, has a shadow displaying, meaning it is most equivalent to the ultra setting here. Beyond this, other settings offer little differences for scarcely any performance benefit, such as the shading quality option, which looks the exact same in many of the scenes I tested. Or you have the options that sacrifice core features found on consoles in spite of a performance advantage from that. You have the global illumination setting, for example, which offers a coarse bounce lighting in the game. Around 4% better performing with it off, but then you're below consoles. Or you have the dynamic reflections option, controlling screen space reflections. Around 4% better performance when set to off, but then again you're below consoles. The one very visually important setting that sets PC apart is that of geometric detail. Simply put, this controls the range at which the level of detail for models, switches, and when they draw in. On the Ryzen 1700X RTX 2080 Ti PC, I was not able to yield a difference in performance between ultra and low on the GPU side of things in spite of it having very obvious visual differences. Going down to low from ultra incrementally decreases the amount of objects in the world in the distance while ramping up the obvious pop-in close to the camera. Going over to Xbox One X here, I could determine that the range at which the brush along the side of the road drew in was in fact closest to the medium setting, where ultra and high push out LEDs further, so the car is actually further away here if you were to line them up, and low pulls that in even tighter, so the car is actually closer here. As I say that though, I did experience a chunky stutter loading of a certain kind with world occlusion both on Xbox One X and even on PC on the ultra settings. Somewhat disappointing. As this is the biggest visual difference we can see between consoles and PC, I would imagine this is an area where CPU performance is key and the Jaguars in console are notoriously low end. Even then, pumping down the resolution to pitiful levels to free up that CPU sees only a 6-7% to CPU performance increase on the Ryzen 1700X clocked at 3.9GHz when going from ultra to low. Not a whole lot, but if you happen to see your GPU utilization going below 99% rather often, or if you're getting stuttering, then I recommend turning this setting down. 
otherwise use high or ultra, as that is the place to be. Speaking of stuttering, that is one problem with Rage that still irks me and goes beyond the options menu. With Vulcan being the API in use and the only one available, I thought this game would be the pinnacle of avoiding momentary frame time spikes or odd frame rate issues, as the devs now with Vulcan have greater control over resources and streaming, but those stutters are still there. When flying through the world in a car at 60 FPS, you will probably see the occasional slowdown or one or two frame blip as the frame time spikes. It's not always there, but it can happen. I even recorded some longer multiple hundred millisecond spikes in play after I loaded up the game freshly once. And much like on consoles, the in-game menus for upgrades can run rather poorly, dropping below 60 FPS and hanging constantly. I really hope a patch can clean up these issues to make sure the game keeps a near constant 60 FPS or higher if your hardware is really up to the task. And by higher, I mean higher. This game can actually run very well at 120 FPS, as I tested out on the Ryzen 1700X, which is not the best single-threaded CPU out there. Beyond dips and stutters when traversing in a car, 120 FPS is very much so doable in combat with a CPU like the Ryzen 1700X. In the open world with resolution cranked down, it will be around 150 or 140 FPS before the CPU caps it. If you have been writing these things down, which I really hope you actually haven't, my recommended optimized settings in Rage 2 look like this. Just a bit off the top, using high here and there, but preserving those visual stylings found on console. So with these settings, and console settings in mind, how do mid-range PCs actually fare? How can we beat these consoles and what hardware does that require? Looking at the NVIDIA GTX 1060, the results are frankly just okay. Using ultra settings in a test of taking a car from gun barrel to the Vinland settlement, we can see that it is having trouble holding 60 FPS here, unlike the RX 580, which is above 60 FPS the entire time through the play, reaching up into the 70s, and often and generally being 10% or more faster than the GTX 1060. The GTX 1060 does save some face though on console and optimized settings, where it maintains a healthy average FPS number above 60. Of course, in those same scenarios, the RX 580 powers ahead once more in a similar fashion, showing that it has good headroom above 1080p here actually. And as a test to see what would happen, I also gave 1440p a whirl at console settings. While the GTX 1060 falls miserably short of a 1440p60, the RX 580 does a fair bit better, but it would still manage to be imperfect in real play in spite of that advantage. That really does put into perspective the Xbox One X performance of this game, where 1080p 60fps is perhaps really the only real static resolution to constantly hold the frame rate. With that idea in mind, that the RX 580 is generally faster than the Xbox One X GPU wise, I imagine a 1800p or maybe slightly lower resolution 30fps mode could really be doable. Though I'm pretty sure a bug makes your car actually move slower the lower your frame rate is. For example, when recording the footage for this video, the 4K performance took around 80% more frames to complete the same geographical distance in game in car. That's not good. Given how the RX 580 can propel nicely past the Xbox One X, the sky is the limit when looking at that beastly RTX 2080 Ti. The game was playable at a near constant 60fps, minus those open world driving stutters on a Ryzen 1700X at ultra at 83% the resolution of 4K, or around 1800p at ultra. Utilizing optimized settings pushes many scenes up to a near perfect 60fps at 4K, but it would have the chance to fall short. Rounding this video off, I think Rage 2 has a competent PC version. I'm very happy to see a Vulcan only game on the market that runs rather well. We are matching Xbox One X performance here on the GTX 1060 for the most part and beating it nicely on the RX 580. As I say that though, it really should be better. Those open world ticks and stutters should not exist, especially since they are so exceedingly rare on console in comparison. 
Similarly, the dynamic resolution scaling option needs to be intuitive or at least work properly, as of now it does not. And lastly, I would perhaps wish for more options to scale, like the ability to change the quality of volumetric lighting. So yeah, Rage 2 is good fun and for my money a much better running, playing and looking game than its predecessor at the time of its release. So bravo Avalanche. Speaking of bravo, thanks for taking the time to watch this video. If you did enjoy it, hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. If you are already a subscriber, hit that little bell in the corner to be informed as soon as Digital Foundry publishes a video. If you would like to talk to me about your experience with Rage 2 on PC, well, write a comment below or follow me and Digital Foundry on Twitter. And as always, this is Alex, bidding you farewell und auf Wiedersehen.